Hey, today we're going to do an introduction to 3JS camera setups, how they work and how to use them. Along with lighting, getting a solid understanding of cameras is pretty essential for a good experience in games. There's a lot of work behind getting the camera to move fluidly throughout the scene, following the action in a way that feels natural. Players may not realize that as you transition from one state in the game to the next, the camera may have to completely change its logic and behavior. I've worked on projects where we had an engineer whose full-time job was just working on different camera logic. Anyway, what we'll cover today is the different cameras that 3JS offers, we'll go over them one by one and explore how they work, and how to use them in JavaScript. I'm going to take a quick second here to remind you to subscribe, if you haven't already. So for anyone interested in knowing how to define these in code, it's pretty simple. You instantiate instances of either a perspective camera or an orthographic camera with a few parameters. So in this case, I'll start by defining a perspective camera, and we just need to feed in a few parameters and we're all set. I'll also define a second camera here, an orthographic camera. Again, there's a bunch of parameters, and that's pretty much it. Down here in your render loop, you render using the camera of choice, and voila, you've instantiated a camera and used it. But there's a lot of parameters. Let's go look at the docs now to take a quick look at the different parameters these cameras take. Starting with the perspective camera, here on the 3JS site we've got the public API for the camera constructor, and it's got these four inputs. FOV, or field of view, aspect, near and far. So just from the docs themselves, the descriptions are pretty sparse. Field of view is the vertical field of view, then you've got the frustum aspect ratio and the near and far plane. You can scroll down to see if there's much more detail, but there isn't. This isn't the fault of the 3JS docs. They're pretty complete. The problem is that, by themselves, these inputs don't mean a whole lot. You need to be familiar with perspective projections to begin with. If we look at the orthographic camera docs, it's not that different. Here's the constructor for the orthographic camera, and it's got six parameters. Left, right, top, bottom, near, far, with the descriptions, again, being incredibly sparse. Again, this assumes you're familiar with orthographic projections, otherwise these values mean nothing. So let's get familiar with these projections then, and we'll fully understand what these cameras do. Both cameras have what's called a view frustum, which is a fancy word for the shape of the viewing area. They're defined slightly differently for each camera, for reasons we'll explore in a second. The first camera we'll look at is the perspective camera, which more closely mimics natural cameras, aka the one in your pocket. It's also the camera that you're used to seeing in games. Let's look a bit deeper at how they work. So a normal real camera, like the one in your phone, has a field of view. If we represent a camera by this little eyeball thing here, we can draw in the field of view and see that nearby objects appear a lot larger or take up more space in the view than far away objects. A perspective camera pretty much works the same way. You've got four values that define the viewing volume. The field of view and aspect ratios work together to form the sides of the volume. So you can see here the field of view basically changes how narrow or wide the lens of the camera is. The aspect ratio determines how wide it is, relative to the height. The reason this is usually canvas width divided by height is because most monitors are wider than they are tall, usually about 1.77 times wider than they are tall. Although I did get this as a Christmas present recently, which is wide to the point of absurd, and the aspect ratio will be a bit higher. So, FOV and aspect ratio roughly determine the shape of the viewing volume, but there's two more parameters, near and far. You need to provide basically a range, or min-max, for the viewing area. The near plane defines the closest you can get to the camera. Anything closer than that will get clipped and will be invisible. Same with the far plane. This defines the maximum, or how far you can see before things get clipped. Anything past this point will be invisible. Now there's a really good reason for the near and far plane, and that's because computers don't have unlimited precision for representing numbers. In fact, their ability to represent numbers with 32-bit floats is very finite, about 6 to 7 decimal places. We touched on this in another tutorial on generating planets, where precision issues cropped up when doing this at planetary scales. But it's not just at planetary scales. Bad choices in near-far planes can cause some really serious problems in the scene, so carefully choosing your near and far planes is unfortunately part of graphics programming. If I were to, for example, choose an extremely close near plane and a really far out far plane, what you end up with is called the Z-fighting due to precision issues. That's a perspective camera. Now let's understand what an orthographic camera is. Now while a perspective camera mimics a real camera, 
An orthographic camera has no physical counterpart in reality. In a perspective camera, objects close to the camera appear larger than those further away, but that's not the case with an orthographic camera. In fact, objects near or far appear exactly the same size, and that's by design. Nothing gets scaled based on distance, everything appears the same size. The perspective camera's view frustum is this pyramid type of volume, while the orthographics is more like a rectangle. So if you have this point here representing an orthographic camera, there are six values that are used to define the camera. There's the left, right, top, bottom, which define the extents of the sides, and finally you have the same near and far planes. So what's an orthographic camera used for if most games use perspective cameras? Well, first of all, most of the UI, all the 2D stuff that's composited onto the screen, that's probably done with an orthographic projection. Secondly, there's still use for it in actual games. You might also be more familiar with the term isometric view, which can be achieved using an orthographic projection. Now that we know roughly what the different cameras are, let's go back to the code. As you saw before, instantiating a camera isn't that difficult, pretty much this single line of code here. You can also move and redirect the camera by setting the position, and that's as easy as using camera.position.set and supplying the x, y, z coordinates. I'll load this up, and here we've got a simple scene, and the camera is looking at these objects. Now I can use the slider here to update the y coordinate on the camera, and as you can see, the camera starts floating up and down. There's also the rotation of the camera, and that's exposed by the camera's rotation property, or you can use the quaternion property directly. They're just different ways to access the same thing. Using the rotation property gives you the Euler angles, so you can just set the XYZ directly, or you can use the quaternion property, which is a bit more advanced. Quaternions are a whole subject on their own, but for simple projects, using Euler angles is going to be just fine. Anyway, I'll expose the rotation on the Z axis here. So, quick aside, you've got three axes, X, Y, and Z, and when you rotate on an axis, what you're doing is rotating around that axis. So if I have a character that's standing, and I want them to turn naturally, you'd rotate on the Y axis. If I want them to literally turn upside down, the X or Z will do the trick. So I've exposed the rotation on the Z axis, and back in the demo here, if I start cranking the slider for the rotation, we start to spin. Lastly, if you're trying to follow a character around, setting these rotations by hand gets complicated quickly, since you're trying to rotate the camera in a way that faces the character, and the math is not trivial. Luckily, you have this lookout function which handles setting up the rotation for you, and all you do is supply the point you want the camera to face, and 3GS just works some math magic to set up the rotation. Anyway, this was just meant to be an introduction to 3D cameras. There's a ton more to cover, but ideally after watching this, you at least have a passing understanding of the underlying 3D mechanics for both types of cameras. Like always, like and subscribe. Code's available on GitHub. See you next time. Cheers.